0233 hours local, and in a mountain complex in North Korea just over 100 miles from the Chinese border, technicians scramble to remove camouflage netting from the entrance to a deep underground bunker. That bunker has been cut into the mountainside and covered over with camouflage to fool American spy satellites loitering hundreds of miles overhead. The cover of night helps to obfuscate the rush of activity, and the heavy cloud cover is exactly what the Hermit Kingdom was waiting for. Out of the converted mineshaft, a huge truck is carefully backed out. The massive vehicle has only one purpose, to transport the equally massive Hwasong-50 intercontinental ballistic missile. Finally eased out of its hiding hole, the truck begins the laborious process of lifting the giant missile into position. Over 40 feet tall, the missile is taller than a two-floor home and has the power to destroy several square miles of a densely packed city. The launch command officer picks up a phone hardwired straight to an underground telephone line that's connected directly to Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans have to resort to primitive telephone technology to ensure the United States or its allies aren't listening in somehow. On the other end, the North Korean dictator gives a single word. The Hwasong-15 intercontinental ballistic missile fires its main engine, shaking the entire launch complex to its core. Launch personnel hide behind blast screens or huddle inside the relative safety of the launch truck's armored cab, hunkering down in case something goes wrong and the missile and its entire fuel load explodes. Two seconds later, the missile proves to be in good operation and lifts off the ground. A thousand miles above the Earth, the United States' space-based infrared system immediately detects the thermal plume of the massive rocket. A low-Earth satellite sends an immediate flash alert to the 2nd Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. Brother and sister units across the broad web of U.S. missile defense and the commanders of every U.S. geographical command. A second U.S. satellite in a geostationary orbit confirms the thermal signature of a large ballistic missile and chirps a second emergency alert. The massive Hwasong-15 is nearing supersonic flight and has punched several hundred feet through the clouds and into the open sky. The U.S.'s space-based infrared system satellites have now focused their full attention on the telltale thermal signature of the big rocket. Cloud cover may have made it impossible to see liftoff with the naked eye, but the incredible heat given off by the fiery liftoff was easy to spot by infrared sensors. Now the large rocket is screaming through the air, riding a thermal plume several hundred feet long and thousands of degrees hot. The U.S. satellites immediately begin to compare the thermal signature of the North Korean rocket with a large onboard library of known missile launches. In less than a second, there's a match with two different Hwasong-15 test launches from the late 2010s. The confirmed match is immediately sent to U.S. Space Command. U.S. Space Force personnel are stunned by the multiple threat warnings from the space-based network and rush to pour through the data. Humans are far slower than machines, though, and it'll take time to verify the threat. The North Korean missile is now twice as high as a commercial airliner, and its main rocket engine is still going strong. Space Force personnel have confirmed the launch as authentic. An emergency flash is dispatched to U.S. forces in South Korea and across the Pacific. It's impossible to know where the missile is headed this early in flight. Via hotline to the DoD and the White House, the alert is out. North Korea has fired a ballistic missile, possibly tipped with a nuclear warhead. The main engine on the Hwasong-15 shuts down as it runs out of fuel. The missile coasts for a brief second, traveling at several thousand miles an hour now in the upper atmosphere, before a series of explosive bolts just under three-quarters of the way up separate the first stage of the rocket from the second stage. A second later, the second stage engine fires, and the vehicle lurches forward as it prepares to exit the Earth's atmosphere. An aide rushes to interrupt a meeting between the President of the United States of America and the leader of a partner nation. There's no time for formalities, and the President is practically dragged out of the room so he can be informed. North Korea has launched a nuclear attack. Target is still unknown. The President immediately heads for the highly restricted and secretive situation room in the heart of the White House. From there, he'll be able to communicate with American forces around the world and defend real-time tracking data from various American assets. U.S. Space Command issues an order for radar installations in South Korea and Japan to begin tracking the North Korean launch. Sea-based Spy-1 radars on American naval vessels are networked into the massive surveillance effort tracking the North Korean missile. While boosting into space, the missile is at its most vulnerable, but the United States still lacks its capability to rapidly destroy a missile during this initial phase. With development on high-velocity projectiles and directed energy weapons, it's hoped that in the near future U.S. forces will be able to down a missile during this vulnerable phase. For now, though, all U.S. assets can do is watch and gather data which will help determine where the missile is headed and which missile defense assets to activate. With a nuclear threat confirmed, the United States Secret Service begins preparations to move the president to a secure and highly classified location. If the missile is aimed at the White House, the president has less than 40 minutes to vacate. U.S. terminal high-altitude defense batteries in South Korea, Guam, and Hawaii are activated. 
Their powerful AN-TPY-2 radars begin sweeping the sky for signs of the threatening missile. Designed to obliterate an incoming ballistic missile during its terminal phase, the batteries of the interceptors are currently useless and can only defend the areas they're assigned to. Patriot missile defense batteries in the U.S. bases across the Pacific go on alert. These two are short-range defenses which are only useful for defending specific locations. U.S. Aegis-equipped warships in the region are given the same alert. Their SM-3 missiles can also be used for short-range ballistic missile intercepts just outside the atmosphere, but require the target to be in its descent stage. With a range of several hundred miles though, each Aegis-equipped ship can help protect multiple U.S. installations or naval battle groups. The U.S. Northern Command at Peterson Air Force Base begins preparations to activate the United States' homeland defenses. At Fort Greeley, Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the ground-based mid-course defense system is activated, a collection of 44 interceptors. These missiles have a far greater range than either the Mobile THAAD or the Navy's SM-3 missiles and are designed to intercept a target in the mid-course before it's had a chance to enter terminal phase and is still cruising through space. More data is needed, however, and all that U.S. forces can currently do is watch and wait. It now has become clear from the missile's trajectory that this is not an attack against forces in South Korea or Guam. Japan is also ruled out as a target. Hawaii remains a likely target, but so does the rest of the U.S. mainland. The U.S. president is notified that based on the missile's trajectory and speed, it is not a test of a new missile. All the data points to this being a legitimate launch against American forces. Given North Korean capabilities, it's likely this is an attack against either Hawaii or the American West Coast. While North Korea has missiles capable of reaching the East Coast, it's not believed they have the targeting capabilities to strike that far with any sort of precision. The president authorizes the use of ground-based interceptors against the incoming threat and order the U.S. Navy ships near Hawaii or the American West Coast to move into positions to best protect major population centers. Across the United States, a fleet of specially modified aircraft put into the air. These big planes are loaded with communications gear and hardened against electromagnetic pulses. They're known as doomsday airplanes because it's their job to ensure that the President of the United States can remain in contact with all U.S. military forces even in the event of a massive nuclear strike against the homeland. The planes will fly high enough to avoid being caught up in destruction below and provide a direct airborne link between each other and surviving space and ground stations across the world. They will not come back down until the crisis is over, with a special fleet of aerial tankers dedicated to keeping them fueled and flying. For the moment, they settle into an orbital pattern across the West Coast, the East Coast, and the American heartland. The full might of the U.S. nuclear triad is officially on alert and prepared to retaliate against any potential threat. With the possibility of another nation using the cover of a North Korean strike to attack the U.S. with its own weapons, America from this point on has to be prepared to fight a nuclear war against any adversary. Troop recall orders are issued for American units across the world, informing soldiers they must drop whatever they're doing and immediately report for duty. Nuclear-capable aircraft are prepared for a possible nuclear mission, and nuclear munitions are prepared for possible loading and launch. Deep in the darkest recesses of the world's oceans, the American nuclear ballistic missile submarine fleet makes its own preparations to rain down apocalypse on the President's command. The second stage of the Hwasong-15 missile runs out of fuel. The payload detaches from the second stage and using a chemical-powered thruster adjusts its course and heading. The missile is now flying unpowered, riding the incredible momentum built by the massive two-stage rocket and moving as much as 4.2 miles a second. U.S. Space Command issues new tracking data on the North Korean missile and confirms separation of the payload from the second stage. Based on this new data, Hawaii is ruled out as a target. Current speed and elevation dictate that a hit on the southern American west coast is likely. Armed with this new data, U.S. missile defense personnel opt for a GBI launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base instead of Fort Greeley in Alaska. Four of the long, skinny missiles are activated and fed live targeting data, but they can't be launched yet. They must wait until the enemy missile draws closer before launching. The American president is rushed out of the Situation Room and two Marine One, his personal helicopter. Two attachés join the president. One carries the nuclear football, the remote nuclear command authority unit which gives the president the power to order Armageddon from anywhere in the world. The second carries a large backpack-like communications device that serves to keep the president in contact with all branches of the government and the military at all times. Rather than head to a predetermined shelter, the president opts to instead board Air Force One, believing that there's little risk to a full-blown nuclear attack on the homeland. From Air Force One, he'll be safe from the ground effects of a nuclear blast and be able to remain in contact with the rest of the military and government. U.S. and South Korean special forces stationed in South Korea and Japan are mustered and rushed to armories in preparation for a strike into the north. 
These elite units have been kept at high readiness due to recent hostilities from the north. Their specially modified Black Hawk helicopters can evade enemy radar and even fly more silently than any other helicopters in the world. They have one mission, infiltrate known North Korean nuclear sites and neutralize them from within. US and South Korean alert aircraft take to the skies in anticipation of a full-blown offensive from the north. On the ground, forces across the DMZ prepare for combat, and an alarm is sounded in Seoul. In case of hostilities, it's expected that North Korea will shell Seoul directly from behind the DMZ and has so many guns that it can deliver a whopping 10,000 rounds of high explosives per minute to the city of 10 million. American supercomputers calculate the trajectory, altitude, and speed of the North Korean warhead and feed that data to the ground-based mid-course defense system. With careful math, the computers calculate a firing solution and green light is given for the launch of interceptors. Four GBIs lift off from their silos in the California desert. The missiles will fly not to where the North Korean nuke is, but rather where it will be when they intercept it with a dumb kinetic warhead that will destroy the enemy nuke through sheer kinetic energy. As they lift into the sky, TPY-2 and sea-based radars are networked together and feed them a steady diet of tracking data. In Guam, Japan, and South Korea, air crews rush to their aircraft in anticipation of full-blown war with North Korea. First up will be F-15s and F-16s to establish air dominance. Normally, stealthy B-2 bombers would slip in behind the air superiority fighters to take out critical air defenses and communications nodes, but the bulk of the B-2 fleet is in Missouri and unprepared for combat. Instead, the Air Force's big stick, the B-52, is prepared for immediate action. These aircraft will require at least an hour to prep, but taking off from bases across the South Pacific will be able to put steel on target within the day. U.S. interceptors are now in space and speeding toward the calculated intercept point with the North Korean warhead. The interceptors have ditched their ascent stages and make only small corrections using chemical thrusters. If the calculated firing solution is bad, they could miss the North Korean warhead by miles. In that case, it'll be up to the Navy's Aegis vessels to down the warhead before it can strike an American city. Updated tracking data reveals the target is likely Los Angeles. The first wave of U.S. Special Operations Forces are given the green light from the American president to take off in their modified Black Hawk helicopters. Their destination is several North Korean nuclear launch facilities believed to be capable of rapid deployment. Other ground attack aircraft based in South Korea are already on their way to their targets, intent on destroying any ability for North Korea to launch a second attack. The U.S. President boards Air Force One. Upon arrival, he asks the United States Congress for a formal declaration of war with North Korea. The North Korean warhead suddenly breaks up into multiple smaller fragments as it ejects a cloud of highly reflective chaff. The metallic confetti is meant to confuse radar systems and make it harder to target the warhead. The warhead is now in eight pieces. Each piece could be a separate warhead or could be a decoy meant to lure missile defense systems away from the real warhead. U.S. ground and space-based radar struggle to pick out the real warhead from possible decoys from within the threat cloud. TPY-2 and sea-based X-band radars are best suited for this task, and it falls on them now to give a good intercept course for America's GBIs. Powerful processors churn through all the available data to sniff out the real threat from amongst the chaff and decoys. If they fail, millions of people will die. Using extremely precise measurements, the dummy warheads are singled out. Because of North Korea's inexperience with MIRV warheads and the use of decoys, the dummy warheads don't quite match the profile of a real warhead as perfectly as it flies through space. With a good intercept solution, the GBIs detach their exo-atmospheric kill vehicle. It will take six minutes for them to reach their target. There's nothing anyone can do now but pray. Unbeknownst to the United States, China has launched its own rapid response forces into North Korea. Elite Chinese troops penetrate North Korean airspace in fast transport helicopters. Their goal is the same as the Americans – seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal before it can be used again, and thus incur the wrath of the American nuclear triad. With both American and Chinese troops headed to the same objectives, though, this attack now has the possibility of sparking all-out war between the US and China. American EKVs scream through space at over 4,000 miles per hour. They're just seconds from a successful intercept or a catastrophic failure. The first EKV screams past the intercept point, missing the North Korean weapon by a dozen miles. The second EKV hits nothing. It too misses the North Korean warhead by over three miles. A second after the second EKV, the third strikes its target true, moving at a combined speed of just under 10,000 miles an hour. The impact produces a bright flash in the sky for a brief second. Nuclear detonation requires a precise chain of events, so the impact of the interceptor does not set off the nuclear explosion. Multiple ground stations and ship-based radar assets all confirm the good news. Two misses followed by a direct hit. The threat has been neutralized and the dummy warheads will burn up in the atmosphere. The American president receives the good news aboard Air Force One. He can still see Washington, D.C. out the left side of the aircraft. And despite this threat being over, he will not order a return to the White House. 
The conflict has just begun, and more nuclear attacks are possible at any minute from North Korea. On the ground half a world away, the South Korean and US armies are preparing for what will be the costliest war since World War II, a conflict that will make the original Korean War look like a cap-gun shootout. American warplanes are already en route to the Hermit Kingdom, preparing to drop tens of thousands of pounds of high explosives on suspected nuclear sites, and special forces from both the US and China are racing each other to seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal. On the border, the North Korean army is finally making its opening gambit, and over a thousand pieces of artillery begin to rain hell down on the South's defenders. Now go check out North Korea vs. United States 2021 military comparison, or click this other video instead.